Welcome to Friends Congregational Church Sermons. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome and you belong. I'm Jarrett and I'll be introducing this week's sermon. As a first year member at Friends alongside my husband Tyler, we've not only found a church but a vibrant community that feels like family. There are many things to love about Friends Church and at the top of my list is the choir. They bring the sanctuary alive, filling it with music that always moves me. Friends is important to my faith journey. The messages here, they're not just words. They connect me to the Bible, empowering me to embody strength through servanthood, and I found purpose in servant leadership. Friends is about our community, and the service goes beyond these walls. It's about reaching out, making an impact, and being part of something greater. What keeps me coming back is the desire for more, more connections, more growth, and more love. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our ministries in College Station, Texas, take a look at our website at friends-ucc.org. For the first Sunday of Advent, we reflect on a reading from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. The sermon is titled, We Are the Whole, and is preached by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Dan DeLeon. Hear these words. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory and he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch, therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Well, what do we do with the scripture that is so frightening when the phrase we hear more than any other in the entirety of scripture is fear not? We do what Jesus does and turn it upside down. Shall we pray? Most gracious and loving God, come to us, we pray anew. In this time of anticipatory waiting, we pray that you would calm us in our anxiousness and center us in this moment, that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth would be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What Jesus says to his disciples, he says to all, keep awake. The message is for everyone. It's that important. What's more, Jesus says that heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will not pass away. And his words are, keep awake. Those instructions transcend time. They're that important. So if we are supposed to take them seriously, must we take them literally? Don't fall asleep. Keep awake at all times. Try telling that to the parent of the parents of a newborn baby. Stacy and I got to spend some time with a couple with an infant daughter this week, and they were feeding the baby, burping her, and swaddling her, and rocking her. It was so sweet. And later we were talking about it, and Stacy said, you remember when the kids were little and we did that? And I said, barely. (laughs) 
We didn't get enough sleep to remember that season in our lives with any semblance of lucidity. The actor and comedian Patton Oswalt, talking in his stand-up about when he was a parent of an infant, said that he wouldn't have taken all those hallucinogenic drugs in his youth if he'd known that being up all hours of the night would enable him to taste colors and melt walls with his mind. It's humanly impossible to not sleep. So I look at Jesus' timeless command to keep awake in the spirit of what an old mentor told me when I was ordained years ago. Take the journey seriously, but stay loose in the saddle. Other translations of today's text have Jesus saying, stay alert, be mindful of the events unfolding and the times transpiring around you. Keep the eyes of your heart open. A couple of weeks ago, I attended a community-wide roundtable discussion at the Lincoln Center. There were six panelists and two moderators discussing housing and jobs and public education in our community. And there were only 15 people in the audience. On the one hand, I think that's what happens when you schedule an event like that in the middle of an Aggie home football game. <laughs> On the other hand, talking about how impossible it is for poor people to find a place to live, and how jobs don't pay enough to afford housing, and how public education, the foundation for an educated populace being equipped to the effect where we can affect those democratic matters is in many ways suffering. That's not the kind of thing that's going to draw a crowd on a Saturday. Human beings don't like suffering. It's in our nature to avoid it because turning our attention towards suffering can be exhausting. When one of the panelists asked me later what I thought about that event, I said, everyone in that room looked tired, like they needed sleep. But the thing is, some of the people I know who were in that room, they keep showing up, and they keep having those conversations and doing that work that, from a Christian perspective, is very much like loving your neighbor as you love yourself. And I know that they don't do this because they're gluttons for punishment. They're not masochistic uh, literalists. They engage the heavy realities unfolding and transpiring around them because ultimately there is hope and peace and joy and love in doing that. It's like embracing the inevitable challenge of another sleepless night caring for a helpless infant knowing that joy cometh in the morning even if that particular morning is nowhere in immediate sight. Joy was nowhere in immediate sight when the scripture that we read today was written. Rome had squelched an uprising and completely destroyed the temple. And for the audience hearing the words of Jesus that we hear this morning, the temple was everything. It was the foundation and the very heart of their identity. And when death-dealing forces have the upper hand... And when all hope seems lost, as Lord of the Rings, Lady Galadriel puts it, a prophetic response in those ancient times was to envision a future where God intervenes in cataclysmic fashion. In Scripture, this is called apocalyptic literature, but it's not meant to scare us. The Greek word apocalypse or apocalypsis, where we get apocalypse, means uncovering or revealing. It's a pulling back of the veil where all people see the brokenness of the world. Everybody sees what's hurting us. And with that vision of God's world, God's world inspiring us with what Jesus has been teaching us for weeks is the kingdom of heaven motivating us, we address what's broken and what's hurting and what's wrong, knowing by faith that it's going to be right. It'll be made right. See, there is a desire for this apocalyptic stuff in antiquity. And Isaiah, the prophet, cries out on the people's behalf for God to tear open the heavens so that the mountains would quake at God's presence. At first glance, what we find frightening is actually an inbreaking of the vision of God, a revelation of how things really are, a magnification of suffering, and a clear picture of outshining that despair of how things should be. The apocalyptic literature we hear in Jesus' words this morning is not meant to sow fear, 
When we turn it upside down, we find the truth that it's meant to inspire and motivate hope. On this first Sunday of Advent, we don't light a candle of despair. We light a candle of hope. And as my friend the Reverend Eric Fissler says, hope is born out of an acknowledgement that the world is not as it should be. I've been thinking about this and what Advent is supposed to mean for us this year. I've been thinking about the prophet Isaiah when he pleads for God to not remember their iniquity forever. And Isaiah says, now consider, we are all your people. Now, I remember this book that I read during some of the most borderline insufferable days of the pandemic when we were isolated from one another. It's by the Reverend Dr. Carol Kilby, and it's called Evolutionary Dancer, Revolutionary Wisdom, Stories, and Rituals to End Planet Abuse. And Kilby talks about Advent being a time of preparing for our most Christ-like selves to be born. You ever thought about it that way? Advent being a time for our most Christ-like selves to be born. And everyone's most Christ-like self is going to look different one from another. If you think about it, that's beautiful to imagine. And Kilby writes that we prepare to give birth to our best, most Christ-like selves by accepting we are not too small to affect the whole. We are the whole. So I've watched four holiday movies so far this year. Polar Express, Holiday Affair, Elf, and It's a Wonderful Life. I'd never seen It's a Wonderful Life. I'd never seen it before. And after posting about my initial responses to the movie on social media, I learned a great deal about (laughs) It's a Wonderful Life. I've been learning a lot ever since. I've learned that uh, December 9th is George Bailey Day. Go and celebrate. I've learned that there is a It's a Wonderful Life Museum in Seneca Falls, New York. And I've learned that one of the advisors to that museum's board is Carolyn Grimes, who played Zuzu Bailey in the movie. George Bailey's daughter, who famously said, every time a bell rings... An angel gets his wings. Grimes says, I think it was divine order that I was involved in all this because my 18-year-old son died by suicide. He was a senior, and he was getting ready to graduate, and he was scared of life. Things could have been done differently, and I have to live with the fact that they weren't done differently. I just feel like that's another place that I have to help other people, to help offer advice or whatever is needed for someone. That's one of the big things that I've tried to do over the years to help others who are going through the same situation. She says, people who write to me all the time and tell me their situations when someone they love takes their own life, they tell me this and they need to have somebody to talk to. So we incorporate that into the museum because it's a huge situation right now. It's growing every year, especially for young people. We need to try to make a difference and help these kids and anybody that's on the bridge with suicidal thoughts like George Bailey was, because I get letters from lots of people who are on the bridge. So if you find yourself in Seneca Falls this Friday, December 8th, you can go to the It's a Wonderful Life Museum and find a program being offered by United Way of Seneca County and Seneca County Suicide Prevention Coalition called What Does Wellness Look Like? Not what I would expect to find if I were walking into the It's a Wonderful Life Museum, but a beautiful thing to discover. I hear that as a clarion call echoing the words of the prophet Isaiah. Now consider, we are all your people. We are all God's people. Anway Law, president of the board of trustees for the museum, says that all of it, it is about preserving and promoting the message of this film because we're looking, at the pres- we're looking at the prevention of suicide. We're working to have thoughtful discussions about that. This is a powerful tool to help people talk about things and to understand things. And she says that Frank Capra, the director of the movie, wanted the film to make people believe in themselves and believe in each other again. 
People need this movie now more than ever, she says. The message of everyone having value in this world. In this world where hopelessness is everywhere. So when we're feeling tired under the weight of hopelessness and we're tempted to rush to distractions from the world's suffering, let's remember this good news. Twofold. One, at the beginning of the Scripture that we read this morning, it said, after that suffering. All suffering ends. All bleeding stops. Two, that what Jesus says to His disciples, He says to everyone. Keep awake. That's another detail. I don't know if you heard that. The good news is in who Jesus says what He says to. It's in who Jesus invites into this work of entering into the shadows of despair and sorrow and injustice and hate and to actively wait there for the vision of God's goodness to be realized by lighting candles of hope and peace and joy and love. Everyone. It's all of us. We're here to hold one another up in the midst of suffering so everyone would work toward healing and wholeness together through our shared gifts and limitations. We are here to engage with suffering together, not on our own, so that the weight of the world will not exhaust us. We're here to say, fear not about despair and to drum up little apocalypses together, to stir up good trouble, as Congressman John Lewis would say, so that hope outshines despair to the point of justice and mercy and love being realized by everyone, not just a privileged few. We are all God's people. To keep awake is a communal message. And the salvation of God is a communal gift. Jesus doesn't say keep awake to just you or me individually. Jesus says this to everyone. And so keeping awake and doing the good work that we always need to be awake to is not something we need to be ashamed about when we don't get everything done. If you hear nothing else from today's message, take that. Shame is provocative and it weighs a heavy burden on all of us. You may have carried in a whole load of it with you this morning. That is antithetical to the gospel. The good news is liberation. It's unnecessary exhaustion that we put on ourselves. There's no shortage of things that we need to keep awake to and work toward dismantling. Transphobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, war, violence, racism, white supremacy, ableism. But if Jesus tells us to keep awake on the communal level and not the individual level, then we need to keep awake communally. We are meant to come together in faithfulness, being awake to the things we need to be alert about, saying to one another, here's what I can do to usher in the goodness of God and what you can't. And here's what you can do in that respect and what I can't do. Here's what I'm gifted in and what I'm limited in and what you are gifted in and what you are limited in when it comes to lifting up the oppressed and the marginalized and letting the goodness of God be magnified. We're in this together. And in that shared faithfulness, we do our work, and we celebrate our wins, and we lament our losses, and we rest, and we keep on saying God is good all the time, and all the time God is good because we've got one another. And in that community, we've got God. We are the whole. And unto us, a child is born. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this week's message. If you're in the area of College Station, Texas, you are welcome to join us for worship at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Central Time on Sundays. The 11 a.m. service is also live streamed on our YouTube channel, Friends Congregational Church UCC. Our mission is to be united by the example of Jesus to live faithfully, 
love limitlessly, and serve boldly. If you would like to support us, we have a Venmo for easy donations of any amount at friends, UCC, no dashes, no spaces. To find out what's happening in the week ahead at Friends, visit our website, friends-ucc.org, and subscribe to our weekly newsletter by emailing us at office at friends-ucc.org. We will keep you up to date with programs to deepen your spirituality, opportunities to get involved with the church, and will connect you to acts of service to the wider community. Our worship has ended and now our service begins. Thank you for listening.